Chag Sameach and Moadim uh, Lesimcha. It's still Pesach, so we'll still be speaking about Pesach, especially since we actually don't have a Parsha to Shavuot this week. Um, the Parsha reading on on uh, on Friday, not Shabbat, but on Friday, is Shirat Hayam, the Song of the Sea. So that's what we wanted to speak about. And there's going to be two Debray Torah here. There's going to be one that's a little more technical, and we'll start with that. And there's going to be one more Hishkafik. You could probably safely skip about two to uh, probably three minutes, and that's where the Hashkafic vort will start. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, we are in uh, Beshalach, that's in Shmot, so chapter 14, verse 22. Uh, this is based on a uh, Torah I heard from our Bridowitz, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoyed it. Okay, so chapter 14, verse 22. So what happened here is uh, Moshe just ra- raised his arm, a wind blew, split the sea, and, and the Jews start to cross. Now the specific verse says this, so Bnei Israel went into the sea on dry land, and the water was a wall from them on the right and to their left. Okay, fine. So seven verses later, we see, in, uh, yeah, verse 29, and Bnei Israel went into the dry land Sorry, on dry land into the sea. And the water there was a choma, a wall, from the one on the right and to the left. Now the Vilna Gon points out at least two difficulties with these two verses, because they seem to be saying the same thing, but there are two key differences. First, in verse 22, we see that they went into the sea on dry land. And the second one we say, onto dry land, or in dry land, into the sea. So why the switch? In the first verse, we had they went into the sea, and then we mentioned the dry land. And why is the second one we say they went onto dry land, and it was in the sea? So why do we have this change? And moreover, in verse 22, the word choma is spelled with a vav. In verse 29, choma is not spelled with a vav. There's no vav there. And uh, and the way the way of Bradowitz explained, I believe, in the name of the film like Owen, was as follows. There's a midrash that says, uh, on this, on the second verse in uh, verse twenty nine, that this the reason why it says chomo without a vav is because that also spells chema. The walls were angry with the Jewish people. Why were they angry with the Jewish people? Because of their lack of amuna. Now, what does this mean? So, it's an interest that uh, that what happened was the Jews were faced with this ocean, with this sea, and they were being pursued by the Egyptians, and the Jews didn't know what to do, and their reaction wasn't so noble. Um, and this didn't speak favorably to them. But finally, Nachshon ben, uh, Nachshon ben uh, uh, Aminadav, who is the Nasi of the tribe of Yehuda, and some say he was accompanied by the whole tribe of Benjamin, but Nachshon uh, ben Aminadav, for sure, according to all opinions, leapt into the uh, leapt into the sea and kept walking until the sea reached his chin or I think his nose maybe. And at that, and he was like, I don't care, I'm going through, I'm walking into the sea, I have the moon and God, God's going to save us. And at that point, the, the sea split. It was amazing. And then afterwards, the Jewish people followed him in. Um, and that's why, and that's why the wall was angry. They were angry at the Jewish people. The walls of the sea were angry at the Jewish people because of their lack of amuna. They didn't do what Nachshon ben Aminadav did. And the Vilna Gaon points out that that's exactly what we see in the Pesukim. But you notice how sensitive the Vilna Gaon is. So in chapter, in verse twenty-two, we have Vayvof Nesrael betochayam into the sea. On dry land. That was Nachshon Ben Aminadav. That was the first stage. And there, Choma is spelled with the Fav because the walls weren't angry. Why would they be angry at Nachshon Ben Aminadav? After all, he showed us a moon and God. As opposed to verse 29, we have they walked into the into dry land, in the sea. And at that point, and the Choma there is without a Fav because the, there the walls were angry because the Jewish people walked into dry land. The sea had already split. And that's where the laws were angry. That is the technical board. Okay, so now a little more broad uh, and hashkafic. So this is said over in the name of Reb Chaim Shmulevitz. He says this in a, in one of his mamarim. I don't have the sefer in front of me, unfortunately. He says this, and this is quoted or mentioned uh, something I see in art school. Was there's a mechelta that says that the splitting of the sea was of just like an awesome miracle. I don't mean that in the more uh, modern term. I mean that in what it actually means. So if you read the Haggadah, we'll see that, look, there's a, a disagreement in the Haggadah of the, se- the Seder 
then you know the ten the ten plagues were ten uh, ten makas. There were ten plagues, whereas the splitting of the sea was fifty. And there's a different calculation. Well, no, maybe the plagues were actually forty makas, with making the the splitting of the sea two hundred or fifty makas and two hundred and fifty. The point is, the splitting of the sea was much was categorically greater than the ten plagues. To the point where there's a mechelta, there is to say a midrash that says. Even a simple maidservant at the sea perceived a higher degree of revelation than that of the prophet Ezekiel in his heavenly vision. Right, so we see even a simple shevcha, a shevcha maidservant at the sea perceived a higher degree of revelation. They saw a higher degree of nevuah uh, than, uh, than that of a prophet. Of a navi. And, and of course that seems very elevated. That's amazing. What a high level of miracle. But Rav Chaim Shmulevitz points, points something out that uh, most people they don't notice, I certainly didn't notice that, was listen to the Lashon of the Mechilta. After all, what does he call the person who saw it at the sea? He calls him a shivcha, or her a shivcha, a maidservant. What does the, the Mechilta call the Navi later on? He calls him a Navi, a prophet. And what Rebcham Shalavit says is that it's an indicator of how people grow. That is to say, the Shevcha who saw this incredible, I mean, we can't even imagine the level of prophecy that, that she saw. This a miracle that you is beyond description of how great it was. And then what happened to her? Nothing. She remained a Shevcha because at the end of the day, she was given it on the cheap. She didn't earn anything. She didn't work to, to get that level of prophecy. She just she was just given to it as a gift by God. And therefore, she remained a Shevcha. She remained a maidservant. People who just came to the splitting of the sea and just saw it, then it didn't really do anything for them because they didn't work for it. On the other hand, whether it's true that a Navi had a lower degree of revelation because, I mean, he just wasn't there at the sea. His revelation wasn't as great. But what is he called? He's called a Navi. Because to become a Navi, to become a prophet, you need to work on yourself and like and build yourself and and uh, and internalize what you've learned over years and years and just eventually keep uh, crushing your ego and working on your ego and working on your, on your medias and your character traits in a level of humility and your level of learning and understanding and internalizing everything so that you could be called a Navi. And that is the point that Rabbi Chaim Shalavitz brings out. That look, it's true that sometimes we get things for free. We see amazing miracles or we see, we're given incredible gifts. The question is, just because you get those gifts doesn't mean you'll make anything of yourself. You might just remain a Shevcha, you'll stay a maidservant or wherever you are. Whereas if you really want to become something, a Navi, you might, you might see less, but you'll make more of yourself. And that's something we see in the uh, in Pesach itself, because Pesach celebrates its Zman Cheretin, or it's the time of our freedom. And that's important. And the first day is really reveling in our freedom. But what happens right at the beginning of the second day? At the night, we start counting the Omer. Because ultimately, we're supposed to connect that freedom to something greater. And that Omer connects us to Shavuot when you receive the Torah and become God's people fully. In fact, Rav Shemshin Rafael Hirsch, I've heard this from, uh, from Rav Bernstein it's in his commentary to the Haggadah, but Rav Shemshin Rafael Hirsch makes an amazing uh, comment that most people, most nations, when they count, you know, the day of their freedom, their independence day, they count towards the day of their freedom. That's not so with the Jewish people. We have our day of freedom and then we count from our day of freedom to our point of like of, uh, of national assembly of effectively when we give our mission statement as a people, which is obviously the receiving of the Torah. And so we see that that connection, that throughout the Omer, we're actually supposed to be working on ourselves, and that's reflected in the Omer itself. In terms of the Omer offering, begins with uh, the coarsest, roughest barley. It's very unrefined. It's animal food, really. And then you see the, the Omer offering, as you go along, as you move along throughout the days and throughout the weeks, that Omer offering actually becomes more refined, becomes more refined barley. And eventually we move on to onto wheat, onto proper flour, which is human food, and then finally, once we reach Shavuot, it's very unusual, but on Shavuot, we actually offer a chametz offering, which we don't really uh, offer anywhere else except for a todah, and I think maybe there's one other offering. But on Shavuot, we offer uh, we offer bread, which is chametz, of the finest flour. And that's because throughout this process of the Umar, we're meant to be working on ourselves and internalizing this idea, these uh, these ideas and uh, and becoming better people, because as we know, Derech Eretz Kadmal Torah, but of course the whole point of Derech Eretz, what Derech Eretz means is it's a route, it's a pathway to get, our, to get to Torah, and that's when we come to actualize ourselves as the Jewish people. Chag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom, and, uh, and enjoy. It's our Chag.